Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Hi, everybody. This is the MTOM Show podcast. I'm Paul Yeager, joined by Peter Tubbs. Hey, Peter. Hello. I always like you and Colleen are always John too. You're all willing to go along with these crazy ideas, and we're mixing up the year in review yet again. You okay with this? You really don't have much choice. Sure. No, let's roll with it. Yeah. yeah. So you've inherited the year in review feature for the television show. Somebody else used to do it and said they don't want to do it anymore, and that's how you got it, right? Uh, yeah. Must not be present to win. <laughs> I did that thing for a number of years, and I like it a lot. Um, but I felt I felt it was a good thing to pass. So, congratulations! Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> I, or at least I guess last year's wasn't so awful that it was removed from my desk, so my to do list. So, so a lot of the uh, you and I are kind of the process people of can we do this better with a spreadsheet type thing. And when I started doing the year in review, there was no spreadsheet of like what stories we've done or what analysts have been on the show or what jobs we've all done. I just kind of had to do it because the year in review piece was a lot easier than going through the website or looking at the tape archive. And now you can see, you know, we might have something that says Prop 12, dairy program, cost of weather. Then the next one, Ida destruction, rabies disease work. That was a feature. And it just kind of make it just triggers our mind at least mine. Does it you? Oh, absolutely. Because and especially since my brain gets so hooked into what's the thing of the moment, it's hard for me just to pull out a thin air. What did we talk about last year? I need to go through the list to go, oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. You know, or just like search the website with my name. And so I get every story that I did comes back at me and I can write them down. Yeah. Well, and you did cover a number of stories. We're going to cover so this podcast. We're going to do two episodes of Year in Review, and we're going to split it among everybody. Sometimes we've gathered in a room, uh, but I think this year I want to try just kind of an individual basis with different people. So Peter will be paired with someone to be named that you'll see in a few minutes. Uh, and then Dave Miller has to talk about everything. So the, the boss... Uh, just because we'll just talk about general health of the show and he'll tell me I'm doing a bad job and we'll move on. Just think of it as a job review for everyone to see. But public. Yes, but public. Yeah. All right. I have three stories we're going to cover with you. Trade, the meat industry, but we're going to start with supply chain and COVID. We are about to enter, can you believe it, the third year, uh, at least third calendar year, 2021, soon to be 22 of talking about COVID, this whole, it'll be done by summer, by fall, by winter. I mean, you and I both have heard different episodes uh, or discussions from several people where they're like, this is all we're going to talk about the rest of our careers. Do you feel that's the same for us? It's going to cast a long, long shadow. Um, you know, last year I did the year in review and basically almost every story that wasn't weather related was COVID related in one way or another. And you can kind of say, like, say, two thirds of the stories this year are COVID related. Um, vaccines coming in. And so you had improved uh, drops in cases, drops in deaths, but it's still present to a large amount. And you see, you'll see localized spikes depending on your area code and zip code. And so it hasn't gone away. And now, how quickly have the vaccinations been able to kind of slow things and, and, and what's the outlook for that? But that, you know, shutting down the economy to try and fight the virus initially, when you do that quickly and then reopen, it's going to be extremely uneven and extremely random. And so we're seeing a lot of that randomness in the supply chain issues in almost every industry, in the inflation, in specifically in lots of uh, parts of the economy, but that bleeds over into general into the economy. Um, you're seeing that in labor issues as everyone, so, I should say, a big percentage of the workforce is reshuffling. They're going from I'm doing this to I'm doing something else. And how do employers work through that? And how do they find the staff? Um, 
someone that I read sort of described a lot of the labor problems as a slow moving, individualized wildcat strike. As individual workers say, I'm not doing this because I find it to be a lousy gig. So I'm going to go do this because it's better for me financially, quality of life, better for my family. Maybe I'm staying home with a kid, with a family member instead of being out in the workforce. All of those reasons. And it's going to be interesting to see how long will that take to kind of shake out. Will it be another year? Will it be five years? I don't know. We don't know yet. So I, I think... On. I think one of the things that we've talked about, you and I have said several times in the office, COVID accelerated a lot of things that were already happening. It just, whether it's inflation, we knew inflation was coming, but money, printed money in thin air from the, the Fed really accelerated inflation to the point of, you know, biggest growth, uh, year over year and since 1982 in the most recent report. Uh, we knew that there were problems in meatpacking plants with workers. This heightened and highlighted some of those issues. Are there things, though, that surprised you of s stories that became problems that we just maybe weren't keeping an eye on that have come to light? Well, I think the supply chain problems through the whole economy or a surprise. I mean, a year ago, you know, in March and April, we, we saw supply chain issues specifically in our food system, both in where we had, um, you know, millions of animals who had nowhere ready to be processed, who had nowhere to go. And on the flip side, empty store shelves, because the food system is so tightly designed for a very specific sort of equilibrium between eating at home and eating out. And then when that was thrown, when there was no more eating out for a while, they couldn't switch over and suddenly get all the food to people in grocery stores so they could take it home to cook. And then the ripple effect through, you know, it wasn't just cattle and beef producers. It was, you know, uh, people who grew green beans in Florida that left them in the field because there were they, their, their suppliers that were, their processors couldn't switch over correct uh, quickly enough. Um, and so now that has now spread to every part of the economy, it seems, because it, you hear these stories from every manufacturer who can't get, it may be one or two specific parts, or they may not be able to get raw materials in general, or at least to the levels that they want. And so how much of a break is that putting on the economy as a whole? And since, since supply is down at a time when demand skyrocketed, you have inflation. How long will that take to sort of sort itself out? Well, I think gasoline's a little misleading on the inflation, you know, 38%. It's just uh, gas prices fluctuate. I mean, we were talking 4 and $5 gas not that long ago. And then to get down below $3 or down below $2, yeah, it's percentages. But we've been higher before. Some of these other food costs or other costs, no, we have not experienced that since the inflation time. So, I mean, there's the several of the reports that we report on that say, you know, take out the cost of energy and food, the most volatile industries, the rate of X government report was only up three tenths of a percent, not 1.2 percent month over month or whatever it was. Okay. And, and, Go and going back to, and going back to gasoline, I've seen zero reports that the oil industry globally is having any difficulty getting oil to refineries, so, which means that the increase in energy prices are entirely a demand side question. The industry could open up the valve at any time and bring oil back down to $36. But obviously, they don't want to do that. They have some leverage right now, so they're just happy constricting supply and enjoying the extra profit. Have so. you seen anything about chip shortages being impacted? I mean, we know it's still a, a story at cars and trucks, but that story's either we've gotten tired of it or maybe it's not as much of a story. I've been seeing random stories that like, so, like shipping rates globally for container ships have been suddenly dropping after having that huge spike. So either more containers are becoming available or people who are shipping are finding other ways to do things, or I don't know how, what, how it's being solved, but that's one sign that 
the problem is starting to sort itself out. So maybe we, that we see that in a greater supply of everything that's manufactured. Well, this ties into global trade. Uh, we'll go to meat. Uh, we're going out of order. Uh, let's stick with global trade. The, the uh, Trump administration had approved and signed with China phase one. We've been watching phase one come through. Uh, the Biden administration says, no, we're not going to do a phase two. We're going to just work on phase one. The, the U.S. trade rep uh, said, I think maybe in either September or October, said, OK, I've done review. We're going to stay the course. We're not going to really do anything wild. Uh, is trade still a story? I think trade is always going to be the story. Um, but it, it's clear pretty much from day one of the Biden administration they're going to take a cautious but less antagonistic position towards China, kind of play the, hey, we're better off when we work together kind of stance. Um, let's work, you know, let's nibble on the edges, but let's, you know, let's take the temperature down a couple of degrees. Um, and they've made overtures towards Mexico and Canada that, hey, we can work together on things. We don't have to beat each other's throats. Let's, let's both make some money. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out over the next three years. We keep, I keep bringing up to our analysts, um, Mexico keeps buying corn. I mean, Mexico and China and Canada are huge customers. And when they do something, we just kind of yawn at it. We want new markets. We want the new, I guess. Sometimes when you live, I've talked to people who live near the mountains and the ocean and they kind of forget they're there. Like, like, oh, oh, that thing? Oh, yeah, whatever. You know, it just causes sundown early here. And But when you're not from it, it's this big deal. I wonder if in some ways we sort of forget that Canada and Mexico are, you know, a pretty big percentage of our exports and imports. We see cornfield. Oh, that cornfield? It's there all the time. It's just a cornfield. What's the big see, deal? See, that's the thing, though, about the cornfield and the soybean field. It changes with the seasons. It's The mountains are the same all the time. Maybe they sometimes have snow on them. Maybe they don't. Right? Yeah. It's not that far yeah, off. Yeah, that's true. You've covered, uh, let's go back to meat for a minute. Um, you and I have taken a number of calls with Senator Charles Grassley from Iowa. He's one of the only senators that does a press call. And if any politician staffers are watching or listening to this, we sure like that opportunity to ask Senator Grassley anything, any question, any topic he's willing to answer. Uh, for us, he's got a lot of pull in the agriculture community, and uh, he's been on that committee, chaired that committee, so he always is plugged into what we're talking about. You've asked him a number of times because the senator has again gone back to a, an issue that he was doing before COVID, and he's now continuing to do in post-COVID. What is it? What topic? It is concentration in the meatpacking industry and how do we solve it? And I, I don't have the notes in front of me. I think this is the ninth time he has submitted a bill to the Ag Committee to, in one way or another, require the meatpacking industry, especially beef, require 50% of all cattle that are slaughtered to have been purchased on the, on the spot market to go through a sale barn somewhere and you get more price discovery. That is the theory. I've seen arguments both for and against that. Oh yes, this will um, get more cash in producers' hands. So, some academics have said, yeah, it sounds right in theory, but it's not actually gonna work that way. I guess we won't know until it actually gets rolled out if it ever gets rolled out. Um, it didn't find enough traction the last eight times to even leave the ag committee We'll see if there's more interest this time. It's in the weeds. It might oh, man. not be for a huge greater good, but it has tremendous impact for those in that industry. Um, those critical of the industry blame. There's been We've allowed every consolidation for the last 40 years to go through. There's been no oversight. There's been no antitrust saying, oh, no, we think that's too much. And so that ship has kind of already sailed. You can't, it's unlikely in the current political environment that the Department of Justice or anyone else is going to come in and say, you meatpacker, you have too much 
of the market, you're going to have to cut yourself in half or divest yourself of however many plants or whatever. That's not going to happen. So then you have to look at other possible solutions to allow more um, price discovery and more options and hopefully create more options for uh, producers to sell their animals. Another, uh, I believe this money has, was in one of the bills signed this uh, past year, is money to help small meat processors to either start up or expand. You know, if you're produce, if you're, you know, if you're processing 500 steers a year and selling them locally, well, you want to double your size, here's some money to help you do that. That might help, you know, it's, it's, it's a small percentage of the meat uh, producing industry as a whole, but maybe in some areas, if some small lockers can double their size, it gives producers options to, instead of just the one plant down the road where they have to kind of take whatever price is offered, maybe they can distribute meat some other way. And if enough littles double, that will have some impact. It just flat I, out will. I think that's the theory. Yeah. And, and we'd have to talk to an academic of how much, how much of the processing would you have to pull away from the big four to really get significant change? Maybe it's a small amount. I, I, maybe, it's, maybe it would be like 20%. I don't know. And, and I probably, maybe it is a little naive to discuss, but uh, I mean, we're talking millions of animals processed, pork and uh, hogs processed by the big ones a week or a day. Uh, and in some of these local markets, uh, local um, uh, lockers, we might be going from 10 a week to 20. Yeah, that's not math that works out. But if enough do it in enough places, there does create opportunity for maybe more specialized product for people. And that would, but that would also mean finding twice as many households who are willing to pay a premium price for a premium product. You know, it's, you're not going to be a locker that's going from 500 head to a thousand head isn't going to be selling boxed beef to, you know, the major meat retailers in the country. You're looking at a, you know, looking at more restaurants, you're looking at those households are willing to buy a side of beef that's, they know is fancy, is, is locally produced and produced however they happen to want it and are willing to pay for it. That's still a pretty small slice of the population. Any other story you want to comment on for the year as you look on your list? You know, still a lot of, um, still always the weather, um, the slow moving drought through the Western half of the U S. Um, we think we talked about last week, the lack of snow pack in November and now headed into December, um, isn't going to help things. So, What's that do in the next six months? And is this just a continuation of a long-term trend of the Western U.S. getting less moisture than what it's used to? And how does everybody adjust? Mm -hmm. It's a story that goes on. It's a slow-moving one. And uh, it's a big one. That's for certain. Have I talked enough? Have I hit my limit? Eh, it feels like we're, we've probably hit the end unless we open up another topic and Sometimes people are fine if you and I just cover a little bit. A little of us goes a long way. Well, I don't want to, and I don't want to take up all the, uh, all the topic oxygen. So I want to leave right. something for everybody else. Keep it focused. Peter Tobbs, producer for Market to Market. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Welcome in part two, our closer, John Torpy. Right? You're here to yeah. send things yeah. into the ninth. Yes, making the sports reference. Because we, we know you love making sports references. Once in a while, I even get them right. We, uh, I, I have to give you credit in 2021. I don't know if it was a New Year's resolution for you, but you did contribute more sports references to the conversation, and I'm, I'm appreciative of that. Well, it's a, it's a consistent and current topic on our aisle, and I like to participate, so... I'm just learning by osmosis. Yeah, well, Peter and I will sometimes dig way too far to make something work. So. No offense, you guys really go down a rabbit hole some days. <laughs> some? <laughs> I think you know. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So he and I discussed <laughs> COVID and supply chains and things like that. We're going to discuss more of the weather with you. Um, 
and the weather took many forms. And Friday's show, the most recent show we did before we taped this episode, uh, we were writing about no snow November in Denver, Colorado. And what did it do on Friday? But it snowed in November. But the more serious thing was uh, several states, 227-mile-long tornado that hit Kentucky. Uh, We're still sorting out everything that's happened. I know you're working on a story for the show that's already aired, but after when we've recorded this, if that makes sense, in podcast land. So let's just start with this, John. This was a very uh, expensive year for weather. It, that number kind of it blew me away um you know and i'll start overall just in 2021 18 weather events each one of them was over a billion dollars and that doesn't count all the others that got close to a billion so you've got wildfires there were 54,000 wildfires that burned close to 7 million acres but 2020 was even worse with, they actually had fewer fires, but it scorched almost 10 million acres. And it's a true sign of the all the side effects that come with a mega drought and a massive drought. But then you also got to calculate all these secondary losses. Like in Montana, it was so dry, it became ideal breeding ground for locusts and grasshoppers they chewed through 16 million acres of grazing land. Cattle producers, if they had, you know, some grass for them to graze their cattle on, then the grasshoppers came in and went, oh, no, we'll take care of that for you. Thanks. Mm. And then, I mean, they just couldn't catch a break. You've got the guys in Oregon, the timber guys. They, you know, I love this quote because it helps put it in perspective for a lot of our viewers. Imagine planting a cornfield and you can't touch it for 40 years, and you it, it, you just hope that it's going to get there at those 40 years, and it doesn't. And they don't have insurance for that. That's a four decades of your life's work gone. So the, um, you know, also speaking of the timber, you've also got to look down in Louisiana where you don't normally think of timber, but they had $750 million worth of damage in three years of crops lost. You've got the polar vortex, also known as an Arctic intrusion, that wiped out the citrus crops for three years. You know, these things will go on and on. So, and sorry, they I'm... do go on, <laughs> and there's the stories are being written the second and third day after Kentucky about what role did climate change play in this. I guess that's a question that could be asked almost at any event. We've had hurricanes and tornadoes that have been deadly, and polar vortexes before in the last three years, before the last three years, when it seems to be climate change, the drumbeat of it continue uh, has started to really hit. So it's not new, but it is a topic that's getting attention. Why? Yeah, if um, I'll quote Secretary Neg from Iowa when he said, if climate change isn't in the narrative, it should be. The... uh, my initial research for the Kentucky tornado, it's been explained to me that the the biggest tornado, the system that stayed on the ground for like four hours, grew completely independent of all the other storms. So it had all the atmosphere it could want to grow as big as it wanted to. I'll be surprised if this isn't an EF5. And those are the moments that's something new. That's something I haven't experienced in my reporting. And so I really want to dig into that. Should we put climate change on these events? And I, and I think there's a strong argument for it. Well, and there'll be an argument that says, no, it, it wasn't, yeah. uh, we didn't do this. This is the type of thing. We're just in a pattern. Uh, there's lots of science, um, I can't say being investigated, but there's a lot of science underway right now as we try to figure out and put data into tables to find trends and things like that. Uh, Hurricanes are not new to Louisiana. This year, that hurricane uh, caused an old problem. It shut the thing down. It shut the port 
down for several days, if not several weeks. Yes, you know, I think it was last year, you know, they had five hurricanes in a row. Three of them went the same path. And it kind of started the same cycle again this year. But one place it took a, a pretty hard hit was Port Fouchon, where 90% of all the work in oil and gas in the Gulf of Mexico goes through that port. And that's something that needs to be in the conversation because one port gets damaged and goes down. That's liquefied natural gas. That's a lot of petroleum. The refineries aren't going to be able to work. That can impact the whole nation in a hurry. Same with uh, the hurricane also undid, <laughs> destroyed a lot of the Army Corps of Engineers dredging work in the channel. They had just gotten clearance to dredge it to 50 feet, making it more efficient to get beans to China, get all of our goods and services to other parts of the world. And, you know, the hurricanes just pushed everything right back in. And so you've got to start that work all over again. In the meantime, the shipping industry is suffering once again, besides the, the shipping bottleneck and stuff like that. So, Well, I was looking at uh, our document that keeps track of stories. Uh, 9-3, so September 3rd and September 10th, we talked about. Uh, and just the week before, there was a story about the cost of weather events at the end of, of uh, August. So, I mean, we were already discussing weather. You mentioned the natural gas and some disruption of things. A case also could be made about this uh, high energy cost that, that maybe Ida caused some early contributions to the U.S. supply of natural gas, crude oil. I would also argue that the um, Arctic intrusion that hit Texas also had a hand to play in that because you've got to remember those natural gas pipelines that were going to and from Mexico were frozen because they're they don't freeze. And so they weren't prepared for that. That's a huge infrastructure hit. Yeah, I'm looking for the date that we covered that. Uh, was, but go back into Texas. Could, and they, they, they're they used to weather swings. They're just not used to weather below zero for as long as it was. And homes are different. Uh, and, and the grid stories, Texas grid is different than anything the rest of the country knows about. So that also contributes to uh, the challenges of recovery. Absolutely. Everybody was impacted by that. And, you know, the, the dairy farms weren't prepared and they lost a lot of cattle. The winter vegetables and those guys, everything was decimated. And, you know, pipes burst in people's homes and, you know, they are that state, the way those houses are built, what they're used to in their climate, it doesn't freeze. And so that's, that really hit those guys hard. Yeah. And they, I think their grid took a one, two punch because didn't it also shut down when it got really hot? There was a little bit of that this summer. Yeah. yeah. Not, Not as, as much, much as it had been in the past. Texas recovers from weather was a story we did on March the 12th. And so March is a time when we think the bitter cold is out. We're recording this in December, mid-December. Uh, we haven't had the cold but one or two days. And it's been that way. I mean, I'd say it's been that way a number of years, but I look back at old posts from a year ago, showed up this morning in Facebook. A year ago, I posted something about a whole bunch of snow in my backyard. And remember, we had snow in October last year on that two to eight inch day where it just snowed for six hours and we looked like a ski lodge or something. So extremes are happening. They are. And it, the, you know, we're entering the driest part of the year and the snow and the snowpack is something that we desperately need. You know, last year at Christmas, my brother-in-law was wearing shorts on Christmas Day. It was surreal because I hadn't experienced anything like that. And that's that. here in Iowa, you mean, or where? Yeah, that was here. Yeah, that was at okay. my uh, in-laws at Rock Creek. So, you know, you look out in the West, and what does that mean? Now, I reported on the fact that there was no snow, and then all of a sudden the Sierra Nevadas are going to get six feet of snow. 
Who knew? What's tomorrow? Uh, What's tomorrow going to be? Come on, come on. I need to place yeah, a, a wager on it. Starting to get get a handle on this meteorology thing. Just a few hours short of my degree. Um, you know, but that snowpack is so vital. They're already going through a huge drought, a mega drought in out west. And I learned that this spring, 700 acre feet of water that normally rolls out of the mountains never showed up. They were already in D4 before their help never arrived. So those huge moistures, those big snows, all that stuff, that's a huge sign for our spring. And, and what what is plant, what does planting look like? What does next year's spring look like? It's it's definitely in an extreme swing. All right, uh, as we wrap up here, John, uh, we talked recently about Iowa's wild weather and the, the work that you were doing on that. And you can watch that uh, those efforts back on our uh, webpage, markettomarket.org, as well as iowapbs.org. Uh, you are working on a weather event for next year, a weather, weather coverage, maybe not a weather event, but you have more weather coming. What? Give me a quick look at yeah. 2022 and John Torpy's weather world. <laughs> John Torpy's weather world in 2022 looks like this. We're going to focus on flooding right around springtime. It's going to air in April. We're going to look hard at everything that came together for Hamburg. Because, Iowa. Yeah, in Hamburg, Sorry. Iowa, the flooding started in South Dakota. And all the things that had to come together for that area of the country to get flooded three separate times in a year. We'll also look at some mitigation projects that communities and towns have done to help control it so that they can try and do the best they can to live in harmony with the bodies of water. But then we'll also keep a close eye on what happens this spring. It's predicted that we will have heavier moisture amounts this spring what does that mean when you have super dry soil that runs off a lot that can cause a lot of problems so we'll be visiting the past but we'll also be keeping an eye on the current situation and see where that narrative takes us and how it impacts farming in rural iowa dry soils and uh not able to handle water on a, a quick basis reminded me a story i saw just this morning and we've seen it before it's not new but where these wildfires have been, let's wrap it back to where you started in California, uh, where the ground is charred and there used to be trees and all of a sudden it's raining. The water's not staying put, creating a whole nother problem, mudslides. And maybe you'll report on that soon or then later. Yeah, uh, that's up next. So, <laughs> what else is on your list before we close, John? Um, the only other thing that I want to talk about, but I already kind of got back. I mentioned it with the dredging is also we'll be watching uh, work that's going on on the Mississippi River in the locks and dams. They are almost 80 years past their lifespan with weather events becoming more extreme. A drought could take one out just as easily as a flood can take them out. If, if that happens in our inland waterway, it could create such a massive bottleneck for agriculture. It would decimate the roads trying to truck grain or trying to use rail to get it somewhere. And I think a lot of work needs to get done or we could find ourselves a lost leader when it comes to agriculture because we just never fixed our rivers. I give you a chance to do something uplifting and that's what you deliver. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just a realist, Paul. <laughs> all right, Mr. Realist. Thank you, John Turpy, for all your work in 2021. Looking forward to your work in 2022. Same to you. That will do it for this installment of the MTOM Show podcast. Our guest has been John Torpy and also Peter Tubbs. If you have any feedback, hit us up. Market to market at iowapbs.org. This is a production of, as it says on John's shirt, Iowa PBS based in Johnston, Iowa. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.